All right. Um, Sai, do you want me to go ahead and introduce us? And does yeah. That sound good? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a Skill Builder podcasting resources session. My name is Christopher Bishop. I am uh, the head of Access Services, and I'm also a liaison librarian here at Agnes Scott in the McCain Library. Sai is. I am an IT technician at Agnes Scott, uh, but prior to my role, uh, Transitioning to this role, I worked as part of the CDVL, and I currently host the CDVL's podcast, The Digital Breakdown. So. Um, and uh, part of the reason I, I presented this to, to Sai is, like I said, there's, there's a few classes that are doing podcasting, and podcasting is certainly something I enjoy um, and, and I like a lot, so it, it's also it's kind of a personal interest, too. Um, and just, you know, based on the description, and I think you all know this, but during the session, um, we're going to learn about three basics of starting and maintaining a podcast, idea generation, production, and distribution. Sai is going to spend about 15 minutes talking about that. And then the last 15 minutes, and when I say it, it's not hard and fast, if, if we go longer, that's great. Just that's what we were thinking of was about 30 minutes um, with time for Q&A and all that afterwards. Or if you have questions as we um, go along also. And then I'm going to look at, I was saying to Sai earlier, I'm going to be the, the Debbie Downer, the eh, eh, eh. I'm going to be the one that talks about the copyright implications. There's lots of ways to use material in your podcast, things that are available for free or to look at copyright considerations, but I'll talk more about that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Are you ready, Sai? Yes. Okay, and you just tell me, Sai, when you want me to advance. Okay. All right. Um, so I'd like to think of podcasting as a three-step process. Idea generation, production, uh, and yes, the slides will be shared. Um, right, Chris? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, idea generation, production, and then uh, distribution. So uh, that's the way I structured this kind of like breeze through podcasting 101. So the first thing that you want to do is come up with your podcast idea. Um, you want to organize and write down each step of the process so you have something to refer to and something to organize. The more you write down and record, Obviously, that requires more organization, but future you will be really grateful for that. Um, so the first thing you want to do is come up with an actual idea. You want to research and refine your idea. Uh, and while you're researching and refining, you want to come up with your audience, the format, and the topic. Ideally, you want to be able to describe your podcast in one sentence. Once you've done that, you come up with a title. So for example, for the digital breakdown, uh, this is my one sentence. For my monthly podcast, The Digital Breakdown, I interview members of the Agnes Scott community on the past, present, and future of navigating a digital world. Um, you always want to take into consideration the uh, scope of what you're trying to do when you're trying to hunt down your audience. When it comes to format, there's not just one format for a podcast. It can be interview style. It can be uh, just two co-hosts or multiple co-hosts talking about something or in a way giving a lecture, but make it entertaining. <laughs> um, there's many different formats that you can utilize for the podcast format. Uh, after you come up with the idea for your podcast, you want to come up with episode ideas. So on a mini scale, you want to research and refine your episode ideas in accordance to the podcast topic and episode scope. You want to be able to write a blurb for each uh, episode idea. And if you find yourself straying away from your original purpose, you probably want to revisit your podcast idea overall. Uh, this, some people like to come up with the podcast idea and then worry about the episode ideas later, but I kind of suggest against doing that. The more you plan, 
the easier it is. You can always go back to the drawing board. You can always edit your ideas. But if, if you come up with 10 ideas for episodes and only seven are work out, that's seven more than if you never came up with any episode ideas. Uh, next slide. And are we doing questions at the end or like, can we do a sprint? I think if people have questions, if, if I think that's fine. If that's cool with you, sign. Yeah, that's fine with me. Um, next slide is about production. So P, pre, during, and post. Um, again, organize and write down each step of the process, helpful for future you. For pre-production, again, plan ahead as much as possible. Uh, and that means a, writing down the episode ideas, writing down the blurbs, thinking of potential guests. Uh, for my podcast, I've basically created a template for everything. <laughs> Uh, I have an organization, a process tracker of where in the production process I'm in. Is it still gestating in the ideas? Is it being edited? Um, is it being recorded? I have all that in like a master tracking sheet. Um, you want to make sure you get the right equipment and tools for during and post-production process. So. If you're hosting a podcast, you want to make sure you have a podcast mic or a headset, ideally a mic because a mic sounds better. Uh, you can get one on, off Amazon for like $40 or more. You don't have to spend big bucks. Uh, that's kind of an illusion. Uh, of course, at a certain point, the more you spend, the better it'll sound. But when you're first starting out, getting a $40 podcast mic with a pop filter, which I'll show a picture of in the next slide. Um, that's all you really need. Um, if you're doing a format where it's two co-hosts and that's just it, uh, make sure both of you have podcast mic and ideally the same type so the audio quality is consistent. Uh, if you're doing a format where you're in interviewing guests, that's where it gets a little dicey. And I'll talk about more about that during the, the next part of the production phase. But um, yeah, uh, as far as the post-production process, just download Audacity. It's for audio editing. It's free. It's open source. Um, you can learn about it or you can learn as you go. I would suggest uh, watching like some tutorials, like a very beginner tutorial. We have one on the CWL website. Uh, the next phase is during the recording. Um, and I always like to preach, the better the source, the better the final result. If your original audio has cars in the background, is recorded in a garage, it's going to sound like, you recorded in a garage and there's cars in the background. It's never, you can't, you can't fully erase that. And to make it sound as good as possible is gonna take a lot of editing. So um, my suggestion is always to record in a quiet place with no echo, like a closet or a room with furniture and a towel to keep the, if, if there's like a door, door crack, put a towel on the floor, uh, just to isolate sound. That's why uh, recording booths have those panels on the wall, uh, just to absorb sound and reduce echo. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, if you have guests coming on, and of course you're first starting out, and because we're in a pandemic, having a field engineer or sending a guest uh, the appropriate equipment is not really feasible and it's not really that cost efficient um so encourage guests that either have a headset or their own microphone if you cannot provide it you don't have to tell them to go out and buy one but if they have one encourage them to use it uh even if it's just airpods or like a micro like a headset with like a microphone like this or it's attached down at the bottom like anything that could help reduce 
extra sound. Um, as for post-production, you want to budget time appropriately. The rule of thumb um, is three to five minutes of editing per minute of a podcast. So if you have a 20-minute podcast at most, it should take you 100 minutes to edit once you get into the swing of things. And like I was saying, better the source, better the final result. Um, can't stress that enough because sometimes people are like, oh, I'll just handle that in post-production and it's, it'll just sound bad so, uh, if there's too much echo, if there's too much uh, background noise, like there's only so much you can do. Uh, next slide. Oh, before we go on, Sai, could you, because I find that's where people have the most problems is they, when, especially when they're starting out, they record things and they think, oh, I'm just going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand what a pain it is and how hard it is to do that. What would you say, is it, if you record something and you're like, you know what, there's all kinds of background noise, would you suggest that you just re-record it? Is, is it ever really worth the time to go in and try to fix you know, if there's a lot of noise or distortion or levels? It depends. Um, when it comes to, it depends on your podcast format, in my opinion. If you have a podcast format where it's just you and a co-host, uh, then I would suggest re-recording it. Um, if it's a podcast format where you're inviting guests on, that's more of a hassle because you'll have to rearrange the time with the guests and then you'll have to um, figure out what to change all over again. Well, you don't have to figure it out all over again, but you have to tell them what to change. And that, depending on the guest, that may or may not be possible. Um, so, uh, but if you can re-record, I would say go for it. But if you have a guess, then kind of do the best you can with what you have, in my opinion. Okay. Next up. So this is the podcast microphone with a tripod and a pop filter. Uh, the tripod is the thing that makes it stand up. The pop filter, when you are speaking and you're saying things that start, have a lot of uh, like harsh sounds like, P's and S's, uh, the pop filter basically prevents it from the mic popping, literally. Uh, <laughs> so it doesn't sound like uh, someone spitting on the mic almost. Next slide. And we'll talk to um, Sai at the end. When I'm done talking, I was going to talk about equipment that the library has. So we do have some of these things available to you. And the final step is once you've created your podcast um, and you've determined like a release schedule, uh, you want to pick a hosting platform suitable for you and your budget. There's two hosting platforms that I'm familiar with, but there's like so many out there. But these two um, are probably uh, the best in my opinion. So Anchor is free. It distributes to all major podcast platforms. The only downside to it is that you can do one podcast per account. Um, when you're first starting out, that's not that big of a deal. But if you ever want to expand, then you might want to look into something like Transistor. It's not free. It distributes to all major platforms. Um, but you're able to have multiple podcasts under one account. Um, and another tool that I use that I forgot to write down is called Zencaster. And Zencaster gives you the ability to uh, record interviews uh, online. So you get, uh, you generate a link, you send that link to your guest or whoever it is, and Zencaster records it as much as possible. Yes. Yes, Agnes, Zencaster, um, records it as uh, two separate tracks. Or how many, how, how many ever people are on there, it records it as a separate track. So my audio is separate, my guest audio is separate, and that makes it easy to account for um, noise reduction 
in one person's audio, but it's not needed in another person's audio. So, or volume needs to be raised in one person's audio, but the other audio is fine. Like it helps with stuff like that. Uh, and it's a uh, pretty, it, it's lower bandwidth than recording a Zoom call for audio. So if someone has like internet troubles, Zencaster is a good solution. Uh, next slide. So this is just general tips. Um, you think of idea generation, production, and distribution as a cycle to revisit the things that are not working. Um, that's why I said record what you do, like write down what you do so you can revisit the process if necessary. Uh, consistency is key. You want to release on a consistent basis to grow your audience. Uh, you want to stick to one platform. And in terms of how long a podcast should be, I like to say, think about, have two categories in your head. Know what you think you can handle and know, and know what you know you can handle. Um, the book that I read about podcasting suggests doing no more than 30 minutes because of people's attention spans and commutes. But if you want to go above that, that's fine. Just make sure you can actually, you know you can do that on a consistent basis. Because uh, if you say you're supposed to release bi-weekly and you end up releasing like maybe once a month because of the length of the podcast and like other factors, then that's difficult to keep a audience uh, paying attention. Um, Next thing you want to do is try being a jack of all trades, then delegate as needed. So what I mean by that is try doing the podcast with yourself and your co-host and y'all can try to, or y'all or yourself can try to do the editing, the promotion and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I have sources at the end of my section um, about that. Um, recommended books and stuff. Uh, but when you're trying to be the jack of all trades, it's easier to identify at the end of the day. It's like, okay, I really need to delegate this out. And this is how I want this to be delegated out. It's just kind of getting a taste and then saying, mm, I don't like that. Oh, I like that. Like stuff like that. Um, if your format allows, record as much as you can ahead of time and then use a time release feature on your hosting platform. So you can have like a season's worth of episodes recorded and then just have Anchor release it like every two weeks, every week or whatever, just so you don't have to worry about constantly having to scramble to meet your deadline. And the next slide. So the sources I use, um, a while back I read this book called you, So You Want to Start a Podcast by Kristen Meinzer. It's incredibly helpful. Uh, I would suggest uh, reading it. Um, I also attended a podcasting workshop. Um, and I have experience with the Digital Breakdown, CDBS podcast. And as far as how many followers is considered to be decent, it depends on your audience. Like if you're doing a podcast, because the Digital Breakdown, we're kind of trying to target the Agnes Scott community and then slowly build our way out eventually. But even like 20 listeners to your podcast, that's better than none. Uh, I know some podcasts that have tens of thousands of listeners, like the, my favorite one called The Read. So it's kind of, it depends on your audience and how many resources you have for advertising. So, yeah. Hey, do, um, any questions before we move into the legalese? Um, yeah, if you could, um, between Chris and Cy, like any like good podcasts that you follow that are good examples or a good format or anything, we'd love to, you know, hear about it. Did, did you say it was The Read? Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> I listen to, personally, I listen to like about 19 different podcasts. Uh, so, 
every genre out there I've probably dabbled in. Um, so uh, The Read is a good like social commentary comedy podcast. It's targeted towards uh, Black people. Um, so that's the primary audience, queer Black people and just regular Black people. Or not regular, but non-queer Black people. Uh, and uh, I also listen to stuff you should know about or things you thought you knew. Yeah, stuff you should know about is just two journalists talking about misconceptions of history. Um, and one that I listen to that has guests is called Species United, and it's a vegan podcast. And mostly, I, I, I love. Oh, sorry. Oh no, I'm no, sorry. you go ahead. No, you go ahead, Agnes. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say I like Hidden Brain a lot. Shanka Vedantam mm -hmm. one from yeah. NPR. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just gonna say I, there's there's um, a number of podcasts that are offered by the Library of Congress that I like, and then there's a number of ones that deal with music that I like too. I think what's interesting now with podcasts is there are so many that no matter what your interests are. And you can learn so much from them and you can multitask. You listen to it in the car or when you're walking or whatever you might be doing. Cause personally, I really like podcasts, but I personally can't stand audiobooks, And I don't, I don't know why that is. I can be fully engaged with a podcast, but an audiobook, like three minutes into it. I'm like, ah, I don't know what's going on. I can't follow the plot. So I, what I think, what I love the most about podcasts is how niche they can become like they can speak to all these people and yet you can have these very specific interests and be like oh wow it's like this person is talking to me so oh um what? Uh, uh, i was uh gonna like touch back on the three podcasts i mentioned and like if you want to listen to them for like good examples like the read is a good like off the cuff podcast example uh things you're, you're wrong about not stuff you should know that's a totally different podcast but You're Wrong About is a good uh, example of a research-heavy podcast. And uh, Species United is a good example of an interview-based podcast. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and move forward. Okay, so I don't want this to come off as the disclaimer part, but it's definitely kind of a copyright um, legal section. And some of the things we're going to talk about is eh, it's kind of going to be things you can't do, but I want to make sure everyone understands. I'm going to give you lots. I mean, I think I've listed like eight or 10 different resources for finding public domain and copyright free music, sound clips, things like that. So it, this is more something to consider, but it, I don't really think it's that big of a roadblock. And unless you plan on for whatever reason, playing lots of copyright music, Usually music's gonna be more incidental background. It really shouldn't be a concern. That said though, I think that music in a podcast can be very effective in transitions, background, things like that. So it's definitely a useful tool. And some of the myths, and these are myths about copyright that exist overall, but certainly within podcasting. Uh, myth number one would probably be using a small segment of copyrighted music is acceptable. It's not, if it's copyrighted, I have to gain permission to use that. So either I buy a license to it or the original copyright owner gives me that permission. And we'll talk a little bit more about fair use. There are ways around this with fair use, but that can be kind of limited. Um, also, sometimes people think, oh, well, you know, in the podcast, I'll just tell you who the artist is, I'll give them credit, and it'll be fine. And again, that's not providing credit doesn't make it acceptable. It doesn't give you the right to use that, that copyrighted music unless you've secured that copyright in some way. Um, another one that can be really problematic is the idea that if I'm a nonprofit, I can use that copyrighted music. And I'll give you a good um, example. I would say every year around MLK Day, we will have at least one, if not multiple people come to us and say, hey, can you help us find some MLK speeches? Because we wanna use those with um, MLK Day. And it's like, no, you can't, unless you're gonna have to buy the copyright. And people are like, but wait a minute, we're a nonprofit. I'm gonna use MLK speeches to talk about, um, 
you know, anti-racism and diversity and things like that. And it's like, no, those are not in the public domain. They are copyrighted and the King Center owns those. So you cannot just play them. Now you can pay the King Center and you can certainly use them then. So again, you got to be careful just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean that you can use copyrighted material. So that's another no-no. Um, and then also the idea that my use of copyrighted music falls under fair use. We're going to talk about fair use. But also it's like, well, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm good, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. That again can get you into trouble. I listed some resources here um, so you can kind of explore that more fully. So it's just to say that you have to understand that because you have good intent doesn't mean you can use copyrighted material and you want to be careful. I do want to make sure though that everyone understands, let's say if I have a podcast and I'm commenting on a book or talking about a movie, I can do that. There's certainly no problem with me doing that. Now that said, if I take a uh, 20 second audio clip from the movie and play it within my podcast, well, that would be infringing on their copyright. I need to get permission to do so. Any questions about that initially? Sometimes that can be kind of, uh, it can be annoying to some. This idea of fair use, uh, basically it's the legal doctrine that promotes freedom of expression by permitting the unlicensed use of copyright protected works in certain circumstances. Um, and those circumstances can be use of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. So for example, if you were playing an audio clip that was copyrighted, but you were doing it in a class, to present as part of a lesson. You would be protected, that's fair use. If though I take a clip of music or something that a copyrighted recording and I put it in my podcast and I'm essentially entertaining, then that is a problem. There's a YouTube uh, person I like a lot and he ranks albums and things like that. And I would say every other, um, video that he does, he'll have to comment on the fact that people say, well, why don't you just play the music? I can't hear the music from these albums that you're talking about. And every time he explains, if I play the music, then I have to pay the copyright owner. And he's like, honestly, I don't want to pay the copyright owner. So he can talk about the music. He can talk about the artist. He can talk about the album. He can talk about all those things. He can even show the album, but he can't play a clip or else he's going to have to pay. And if he doesn't pay, then they would pull it down. And I think an important thing here too is to understand the chances that you're going to have your, you know, if it's on Spotify, they may pull it down because of a copyright infringement. These are the kind of things that you may or may not get caught if you're breaking copyright. So just understand it's, it's really more up to you. It's more about ethical use. Um, but so I, I'm not, I don't think it's something you need to be afraid about. Could you be sued? Sure. Are you probably going to be sued? No, it's more just to think about ethical concerns. Um, and clicking here, this is a fair use checklist. This is linked from the, uh, copyright guide that uh, the library has. And basically what this does is it goes through and it looks at what is your purpose? What is your, the nature, the amount and the effect? of the work you're using and basically allows you to do a fair use analysis and then you can make a judgment as to whether it falls under fair use or not. So if you were going to do this and you asked me, I would go through and do something similar and then I would give you an analysis. Really though, it's up to you to look at the fair use checklist and make that analysis. It's up to you to make that decision whether you, fall, you feel that it falls under fair use or not. And this right here is a fair use evaluator. It is a tool that basically you, um, you go and you put in the information, it'll walk you through a series of questions and then it'll help you make a determination. So either one of those is helpful. Um, and these are just some other things, again, I'll, I'll share this and, and it'll be up, but there's, there's a copyright and fair use guidelines uh, from McCain Library, which goes into a lot of detail. And then fair use fundamentals and podcasting legal guide. If you ever have questions or you're wondering about that, these really help with that. The thing that's probably the easiest to do is to use things that are in the public domain. And Public domain is basically, it's materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws, such as copyright, trademark, or patent laws. 
So if something, you kind of see this chart over here, if it was published previous to 1924, for the most part, it will fall under public domain. There's going to be a few exceptions, like if the, if the license has been renewed, like Disney likes to find ways to renew their licenses. But basically, if it's published between 19, before 1924, for the most part, it falls into public domain. Also, some people will publish things in the public domain. Usually, you'll find a public domain license on it. It'll tell you if it's public domain for the most part. Most um, federal documents, uh, most documents from the federal government or things done by the federal government usually fall under public domain. So there's a lot of public domain. And you can do whatever you want with public domain materials. You can... Um, you can use that music, you can um, remix it, you can do whatever you want with it. So as far as what falls into the public domain, so obviously the copyright's expired. Um, this, the copyright owner failed to follow copyright renewal rules. What that means is did they renew the license and if they didn't. Now I think this is one thing that sometimes people don't understand. If I take something, let's say I, I, I make a song and I go and put it on the internet and I don't explicitly put a copyright disclaimer on it, I still have copyright. I still own the copyright to that. The difference is it's going to be a little harder for me if I go to sue you if I don't put that copyright there, but I still have copyright. So just understand, again, just because you don't see the little C on it doesn't mean that there's not a copyright. Um, and then obviously if someone... Uh, deliberately puts it in the public domain. Um, copyright law does not protect this type of work. Again, that would be like government documents and things like that. And for a really good explanation, um, under the Stanford University Libraries has a great page that goes into tons of detail about public domain. But to me, public domain is one of the things that, yes, I if I was um, advising someone, one of the things that I would say is go and look at the public domain stuff because you're not going to have any liability with that. Another thing is Creative Commons licensing. Uh, basically, this is where the uh, creator has then used a Creative Commons license to say how others can use it. This, again, like public domain, if you find a Creative Commons license on it and it says you can do what you want with it, then great, go ahead. This is, you're going to find a lot of more current content. Because sometimes public domain content tends to be older things. Uh, Creative Commons uh, content tends to be newer. But if you do see, as you see on here, if it says, if you find something, it says all rights reserved, it really means you shouldn't use it unless you contact that, the, the author of that work and ask them for permission or you pay for it. But otherwise, if you see one of these Creative Commons licenses, this is going to mean, oh, it'll tell you what you can do with it. But you'll see there's different types. But usually if you see one of these, it means there, there may be some stipulations, but you can use it within your work usually. And again, I'm going to share this, uh, this Creative Commons link will we'll link out and give you some more information about that. So as far as sound recording repositories, I included these and then on the next page, Free Music Archive is probably my favorite one. And the way this works is you go in, I'll just do this search pro. Everything in here is either public domain or copyright free. You can see it says 100% royalty free music. Everything in here you can use and you don't have to worry about someone coming after you or making you pull your podcast down or re, you know, edit it because you've used something inappropriately. What I also like about this is you see where it's got genre. So let's say you were doing it and you wanted some jazz music. You go there and then basically you're gonna see all these and then you can, it'll tell you the length, you can go in and play it and then you can download it. And most of these, uh, basically, when you see this cart, you can give the artist money, although most of these are going to be free. Um, it would be nice if you gave attribution, but a lot of these you don't have to give attribution either. I think that's one of the misnomers too, though. If you're using something that's in the public domain or has this Creative Commons license or something like that, it is always nice to give credit to that artist. But, you, but oftentimes you don't have to. That's really more up to you. It's more you're just, you're being nice. Um, another one, Internet Archives Audio Archive is another one that I like a lot. And you can see, I mean, there's things in here, everything from the Grateful Dead to, you know, spirituality and religion, community audio. There's so much stuff in here. And then you'll see there's also repositories for podcasts, old time radio. It's just a lot of material here. And so those are great. 
Some of these other ones um, tend more towards public domain, so it may be a little more heavy on classical music but they're also great. This one, like the Wikipedia sound list, basically links to uh, sound files that are in Wikipedia that are public domain or creative commons that are uh, within like a, um, a Wikipedia entry or something like that. And then here's some other ones. CC Mixter is great, Jamindo, LibreVox, Project Gutenberg, which you're probably familiar with for books, but there's audio books in there too. So if you wanted a clip of someone reading from a book or something like that. It's going to be public domain type stuff. So lots of resources there. So you know, before we were talking about kind of copyright restrictions or, you know, having to do this fair use analysis or um, kind of where you run into problems with using copyrighted music. There's so many other places to, to garner these kinds of materials that you can then use. And again, I don't, I mean, how many podcasts are just multiple songs that you're listening to? Not, not too many, so there's ways around that. Um, and then Sai had mentioned earlier about some pieces of equipment. These are all things that we own in the library, either because the CDVL has given us, these all are, and then there's other things that we own too. There's a Zoom recorder kit, which does a great job of recording. As you can see there, there's small mics that you can also check out with that. And you can store hours of audio on there. The Tascam recorder kit similar, does a great job. There's the phone recording kit which does a great job. And then we have two of these Yeti podcasting kits, which as you can see, comes with everything you would need, a little board, um, a mic, a windscreen, headphones, the plugins, everything you need. And you'll see on there too, it says the number owned, like we own uh, nine Zoom recorders, two Tascam recorders, one phone recording kit, two of the Yeti podcasting kits. At the bottom is linked how I can locate and reserve equipment. Basically what that, small tutorial is going to do if you click on it, it shows you how to see the full list of all the equipment we have, and then how to go into our catalog, choose the piece of equipment you want and place a hold for it. And then basically you go in and place a hold and then you can come as long as you come and pick it up within the next few days, you're good. And then also with this equipment, most of this checks out for three days, but especially now with um, COVID, if you said, you know what, actually I need this for a week because I'm really not going to be coming back to campus, we would say that's perfectly fine and we'll just extend the loan for you. Um, and we, we certainly we have some other equipment to um, headphones and things like that, but these are the ones that are kind of the main things that I thought uh, would be helpful. And that is everything I was going to talk about as far as copyright and equipment. The only thing I can think of that maybe, Sai, maybe we should talk about, do we want to talk at all about accessibility? I know I didn't include a slide for that, but as far as, um, uh, as far as like with the file itself, kind of the associated metadata, like the title or things like that, how, what do you, what do you think about that or suggestions? Um, in terms of like uh, metadata or metadata, however you want to pronounce it. <laughs> um, I know some people like to, uh, one of the suggestions in my podcast book was to get a transcript of your podcast for editing purposes, but you can also use that for accessibility purposes. Um, so people can basically read your podcast instead of listen to it or if they're um if they have difficulty hearing or whatever they can read it uh in terms of including uh there is this you know you know how music has tags on it that show the artist the song title the genre like when you download it from itunes and ipod not yeah download it from itunes you can edit that for a podcast, um, particularly so when you export it. I, I know how it works on Audacity. I don't know how it works on other audio engineering platforms, but you can export it from Audacity. And at the final step, you can put in the metadata about the podcast, uh, which would include the title um, of the episode the title of the podcast and you can put like the season and the genre and all that stuff. But with anchor, you can also go further with metadata and put in like categories of for your podcast. So it, it 
gets organized with the right folks. Yeah, because I think part of that's just findability too, because I yes. think it's kind of like um, for me thinking about working with students, sometimes students um, are like, why doesn't this come up or why isn't that there? And, and oftentimes, whether it's a website or audio, if, if those um, signifiers haven't been placed there, then it's hard for a bot to find it. And so I think with accessibility, oftentimes too, we think about, oh, well, it's about people who are sight impaired. But again, it may, there may be hearing loss and things like that too. So I think those are important. I don't, they usually don't get addressed as much in podcasting, but it certainly can be a concern. Um, did anyone have any questions? Again, I'm gonna, I'll share the, the PowerPoint with everyone and then there will be a recording. But were there any questions just overall um, about best practices or other tools that you think might be helpful or even ideas that you had and kind of um, any input you might want there? Well, I, I guess in, in your experiences, um, what makes for a good podcast? Like what are like elements or factors of one? And, and then also uh, like, where do you see like the future of podcasts? It seems like it's been around for a while. Is there any sort of like innovation in the field or is it just more diff like different genres that are more interesting? I think for me, I would say when the host is genuinely interested, but also very knowledgeable about what they're talking about and they have guests on or themselves are very knowledgeable about what they're talking about. And I also like it when someone can take something that may seem kind of niche or, um, you know, like, well, what does this have to do with this bigger issue? And then they're able to blow it up so that you understand, oh, okay, well, I thought of this as just being kind of singular, but now I understand that there's these much bigger ramifications or it has these bigger connections. So to me, it's like, can you simultaneously speak to the individual in something that's fairly specific, but then to hold attention, can you make it about some bigger topical thing that more of us are interested in? And I think more than anything to me, it's what I find to be annoying is when someone, like when you can tell they're trying to fill time and they're just kind of talking and it's like, no, I want, I want to know what's important. Like I'm more, it's like Sai was saying earlier about 30 minutes for a podcast. To me, it's like, I want quality and I want content. I, I don't want you to like, kind of fill it like more you know I personally can't stand morning talk radio because it seems like there's so much filler and so when I see that in a podcast which I don't I don't feel like I do with that often I find that to be you know because I'm tuning in for a specific time and I want you to give me like real and meaningful content so that would be my takeaway what do you think Sai? Yeah um, I agree I feel like uh, it really for me it depends on what genre of podcast I'm listening to. Like if I'm listening to a comedy podcast, being really knowledgeable about the topic isn't as important. Yeah, true. Um, if I'm listening to a history podcast and I definitely want the people to be knowledgeable and like well-researched, but I also want it to not sound like a lecture. I want there to be something different sprinkled in there. Um, which kind of returns to that point of whatever idea you have for a podcast, you want to kind of see what's already out there because there's bound to be something out there already and see what angle you can add to it, what like twist you can add to that topic. That's such a good point, Sai. Have you ever made them with because I have done this where I was like, oh, I've got this great idea. And then I invest all this time and then I went and looked and I'm like, oh, this person's already doing it and they're doing such a great job. I don't, I would be repeating what they're doing. And then I, and I think it speaks to what Sia was saying earlier about preparation. If you have a specific audience, then, you know, you can make that content more specific to them. But let's say if, um, I guess I use Sia as an example, if, if what Sia was doing as a podcast was aimed at just like um, the most general of audiences and not, looking at more of an Agnes audience, you know, it would be more problematic, possibly of less interest. So I think it's one of those things there. 
I hate to say that you should like do this research where it like almost like consumer purchasing information where you're like, okay, well, how many people in this demographic and things like that. But that said, if it already exists and you're being redundant, why bother? Because you're not going to get an audience and then you're going to be annoyed that you spent this time on it. So, but I do think sometimes one person, let's say one person um, in my case, you know, if some white guy is <laughs> talking about whatever, it's like, well, maybe I'd like to hear from um, a person of color or maybe I'd like another, you know what I mean? So I think even though it's being covered, is it being covered from the range of perspectives that would actually shed light? Because oftentimes too, I think people will see something and be like, oh, this is already being talked about. And it's like, mm, no, it's not being talked about from your perspective. Um. Yeah, I agree with that. And as far as the answer to the question um, that, uh, Anna, that you had about um, how to search for podcasts, gosh, that um, really depends. The be Honestly, in my opinion, the best way to do it is Google. <laughs> yeah. um, because there's so many different platforms that podcasts are on. Um, and it's best to say like it's best to if you're looking for a specific podcast that you want to listen to it's best to hop to google like if you're looking for a true crime podcast you can google best true crime podcast and then go from there because it um, will, right so it will literally will rank them and they'll give you like a list i think too spotify does a nice job of yeah. uh, spotify tends to like give you the ones that are the most popular and you can kind of drill down from there but if you do find some that you do like spotify is good at uh basically doing a suggestion kind of like what amazon does where if you buy something it gives you a suggestion spotify will do something like that too which i found to be helpful i also want to bring up there's this app called podcast addict um, if you're a Android user and uh, basically you can pull up the RSS feed for how many ever podcasts you listen to. And uh, this is mine. As you can see, I listen to a lot of podcasts, <laughs> um, but it basically pulls all the, R all the RSS feeds into like one app. So you can just make a playlist and listen through how many ever podcasts you want to listen to from how many ever sources, whether it's like Google, Anchor, Stitcher, uh, so many sources, Apple Podcasts. The only one you can't listen to is Spotify because they don't have an RSS feed, which is really annoying. Um, so, yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And like I said, I will send out um, this PowerPoint. Um, but if, if, any, if anyone has any questions or concerns or comments or anything like that, please let us know. And we will follow up. All right. Thanks, everybody.